It's the way that Moses confronts Pharaoh. It's the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. It's all that we've read about in Exodus up to this point. And so the great work, in short, is Israel's redemption. And what, what makes God's work great in this chapter is something that we, we, we can see rather plainly just by reading through the text. But let me just sum it up in three ways very quickly. As one man put it, that which was a passage to Israel became a grave to Egypt. Mm -hmm. I like that statement because that shows both sides. How God is against those who oppose him, but yet he is for those who belong to him. So God's power works for his people, but against his enemies. That's the first observation. That's why his power is so great. It can be used in that kind of double-pronged way. The second thing that I notice in this chapter is God's power puts things right. It's just. And that's the whole thing. We yearn for that in our hearts. We want things to be right. And we see it all falling apart in our world right now. But we want things to be right. And so God judges in Egypt. And especially the head of Egypt. This idea of Pharaoh hardening his heart over and over again until God hardens Pharaoh's heart. He has such a hard heart that God's mercy is not allowed to penetrate. And, and it leads to the downfall of Egypt and to this, to this Pharaoh. So God judges them and relieves Israel both at the same time. Again, that's what makes God's power so great in this text. And then the third and final thing that I would observe about God's power is that it's manifested for his glory. The power of God is for the glory of God. Mm -hmm. right? It's not for us to presume upon. It's not for us to wield as a talisman. right? It doesn't belong to us. It belongs to God. And, and he will manifest that power as he sees fit. Now, we shouldn't forget that. When, when God demonstrates his power on the behalf of his people, it's to exalt himself, not the people. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we forget that. He is a great God manifesting a great power. It's a power that's omnipotent, all-powerful. Nothing approaches it. And so how do we respond to it in the text? Well, we fear the Lord and believe the Lord, even as Israel did. That's the main thing that we get from Exodus 14. I think we get the whole thesis right there at the end of the chapter. God's power reinforces very, very important ideas here, very important concepts, and I would say really encouraging concepts for me. Number one, our God is to be feared, and number two, he's to be trusted. And we can fear and trust the Lord. Notice that this evening points up both of these qualities when he says, so the Lord feared, so the people rather feared the Lord and believed the Lord. So what does he mean by fear the Lord? And I, I've talked about this several times, but I think it, 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 it gets lost on us much of the time. We fear the Lord because we know that he has, if we look at some New Testament concepts of fearing God, we know that he has the power to, to destroy both soul and body in hell forever. That's why we fear the Lord. That's right. Now, we know that we are secure as Christians, that we belong to the Lord. But that fear is there nonetheless. They feared him, that when I say they, I'm talking about Israel, they feared him for a little while. I mean, it was a temporal deliverance, right? Um, when we're talking about the redemption of Israel from Egypt, we're talking about temporal deliverance that later pictures the, the, uh, the spiritual deliverance that happens for us today. And it's something that Israel relied upon uh, throughout their journeys in the wilderness and when they went into the promised land, too, where we're reading in Deuteronomy for our Bible reading uh, this week. But they feared him only for a little while. I mean, we've read through the books of the law, and, and as we read through them, we see that it only lasts for a little bit, and then they stop fearing God, they marginalize God, they stop trusting in God, and they begin to complain. So that's going back to what I was saying at the beginning. There's this temporal relief from burdens. God lifts the burden. Oh, you're hungry? Here's some food. You're thirsty? Here's some water from a rock. All right? You want some meat? I got some quail. It'll be coming out of your nostrils before you know it. All right? All of that is happening, but, but every time they experience temporal relief, aren't they exactly like Pharaoh? Pharaoh only wanted temporal relief from these plagues. That's right. 
And so we kind of see the same thing happening with God's own people. There's this forgetfulness that settles in, this presumption when, it, when they're dealing with God. And we need these burdens, I think, to keep us coming back to the well of grace. Mm -hmm. had another burden today that I had to deal with, and, and God relieved me of it. But now I'm, I'm quickly thinking, what's coming next? <laughs> because I need to keep trusting in God. I need to keep going to the well of God's grace. It's the love of Jesus Christ that compels us. That's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5. He died for all so that all would die to self. That's what he's talking about there. So that we wouldn't live a selfish life, but a selfless life. We no longer live for ourselves, he says in that text, but for him who died for us and rose again. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 and 15. And so a selfish life, when I'm living a selfish life, there's something in the back of my mind that niggles away at me, and, and it causes a fear inside of me. I think that's healthy, don't you? Yeah. I think we need that, and we want it to be louder, and we want it to be stronger in our lives, so that we're constantly depending upon the Lord as we go through our day, instead of trying to run away from Him to do what we want to do. You know what I mean when I say that we marginalize God? We push Him to the periphery of our life so we can do what we want to do. So that we can sin in the way that we want to sin. That's right. But spiritual maturity is aware of the fact that God has a watchful eye. That he's always there. And that's a good thing. That's a comforting thing for me. But when I want to sin, it's not too comforting. All right? It's convicting. It's powerfully convicting. And so it's either a comfort or a terror. It's either the warm side of the pillar or the cold side. Right? We experience that. God's people experience that. Now the other, and, and this leads out to this other question, and it's a question of trust. Do you believe the Lord? So yes, we have to fear the Lord, but then the next step in the logical progression here is to believe in him. If I know that he is there, then I'm going to trust him. Trust and believe are synonymous. So many believed in Jesus when they saw him work his great miracles, including his disciples. And, and it was for the disciples' good. The miracles reinforced their trust in Christ, and it helped them on the way as they headed into Jerusalem. Now, it didn't solve all their problems, and they had a long road ahead of them, and so do we. But, but it, it did something powerful for them. It was the warm side of the pillar. But there were many others that were on the cold side of the pillar. Many believed on the Lord Jesus because of the miracles that he did. But in John chapter 2, verse 23, it says that Jesus did not commit himself to the many. What does that mean? That he did not commit himself to them. Well, he knew them. That's what the text tells us. He knew them, and he knew them inside and out, and he knew that their belief was only temporal. And they were looking for a bread king, and they were looking for a miracle worker, but they were not looking for a redeemer or a savior. They had no use for that. Right. And so he didn't commit himself to them. But the disciples understood who he was and what he came to do. Now, they didn't always keep that in their minds. We found that out on Sunday. But, but for the most part, they were following him throughout that three years. I think the need for us is a fortified faith. And it, it doesn't mean that we have to have this big, gigantic faith like the missionaries of the 19th century or whatever. But, but we're talking about a fortified faith that comes to us through experience. I know whom I have believed, Paul's testimony was. And that he is able, power, God's power. Right. So if we trust in God, who did not spare his only son for us, but delivered him up for us all, then... I, why wouldn't we freely trust him for all things that we need in our lives? That's why we can pray for everything and anything that we need in life. We hold fast to the confidence that God delivers us and that God can provide for us and that he can still do great and mighty things in our midst. So this evening I want to encourage you, live an eternal quality of life. It's, it's the best way to live. Many believers receive the word of God but they receive it almost in the same way that the ground receives dew in the summer in California. It doesn't take 
any length of time at all for the sun to come up and the dew to dissipate. And, and I think that that's what happens sometimes in our devotional life. We get dew in the morning. And we have it there for a little while and it feels really good. And it's even nurturing to a degree. But then the trials come. The sun comes out. Dries up all of that water, that moisture. And we're left barren and thirsty. There's no depth in our spirituality. Every spiritual benefit that we had in the morning hasn't gone with us into the day. Mm -hmm. And so we begin to complain. And we begin to worry. And our lives are filled with anxiety again. And then we begin to succumb to temptation to, to overcome that worry, right? Whatever that avenue of temptation is for us. And then all of a sudden, we are marginalizing God. We're not washed in the water of the word. That's what we need. Instead, we just have this layer of dew in the morning that dissipates by midday. And so to live an eternal quality of life is to constantly go to the well of God's grace and to have that flow of the Holy Spirit working in and through us. And, and that can be throughout the day if we don't quench or grieve the Holy Spirit as we're living our day. We live it to God and not for self. So let, let's just make the next right choice as we go through our evening. And as we go to sleep, let, let our thoughts be of God and what wonderful things that he's done for us. And as we wake up, may our thoughts gravitate to the Lord again. And may, may we not have a moment throughout our day tomorrow. Let's try this. Throughout our day tomorrow where we're not tethered to him and to the grace that he's providing for us. Mm -hmm. That's an eternal quality of life. That's trusting him, believing him, fearing him. And then secondly, we live in the light of resurrection power. Our redemption is different from the redemption of Israel. It's secure. Nothing can undo it. And, and, and so we keep the death of Jesus Christ firmly in our minds as we go throughout our day. Why? Because we know that through his death, all of our sins have been washed away, past, present, and future. But then we remember the resurrection of Christ as well because of the resurrection of Christ, I have righteousness. I, I will be approved by God as I come before him and before his throne of grace and ask for anything and everything that I need. So the day is fast approaching when the kingdoms of this world will fare no better than Pharaoh's army in our text. They'll be on the dark side of the pillar. Mm. And God will roll them up like a scroll and cast them into the eternal flames. But when it comes to us, we'll be rescued from all harm, from the presence of sin forevermore. And thus, we shall always be with our God. That's right. So we should be grateful this evening. Mm -hmm. And we should exalt the name of God forever. Amen. Let's pray. Mm -hmm. Father, thank you for the opportunity that we have to be here this evening pray and to look into your word. We ask for those that couldn't be here this evening that you would bless and strengthen them. And Lord, uh, we pray that you would bless our prayer time together too here this evening. We love you so much, Lord. We want to please you with the way that we think and talk and the way that we live our lives. We pray in Jesus.